On topic 5.6 today, we're going to be looking at economic growth. And the version of economic growth we'd like to take a look at is how we judge the standard of living for economies throughout the world. So the key terms for this are going to be GDP per capita, which is you take GDP or real GDP, whatever numbers they give you, and simply divide it by the population. Now, GDP per capita is something that can increase if we have economic growth because the amount of GDP that we're able to make would increase. This can happen a couple of ways. One of the main ones is productivity or output per worker. So if you have workers and they're given a certain amount of time and a certain amount of materials, then how do you get them to create more product for sale in that same amount of time? Well, we can do this by giving more capital stock. So capital stock can refer to these three items right here. And that can be our physical capital, our human capital, and technology. So K is for capital, and that stock can be all three of these things. So if today's worker has greater capital stock, then that means we can improve their physical capital, which is tools, machines. Um, human capital is going to be our investment into education, into job training, into healthcare, whatever can make our workforce stronger and more productive. Technology is going to be things like giving them better tools, showing them how to use those tools in a better way, um, even tools that are more improved, you know, the use of Promethean boards in the classroom, whatever it is that makes us more productive. And revisiting some graphs from Unit 1 is how do we show economic growth per capita or anything is more GDP over time. So remember we can shift the production possibility curve outward or we can shift the long run aggregate supply curve to the right and both those show the capacity for making GDP has improved. So full employment, resource, technology, if we add more people, resources, technology, we can have growth. If we add to capital formation, capital stock, any kind of investment into our economy. And let's revisit net investment again as well. So remember net investment is going to be gross private investment is increasing. However, don't forget about depreciation. So if we have depreciation, that means that we would have a negative on our investment because our, our trucks, our machines, our tools, they're going to break, they're going to get worn out, they're going to get old. So if we invest more than we have depreciation, if our investment is greater than our depreciation, that means we're replacing our capital, our physical capital, and our technology at a rate better than it is going away or breaking or anything like that, then we'd have a positive net investment. If depreciation exceeds our investment into our physical capital or our capital stock, then we would have negative net investment, and then this would actually shrink inward. We want this to expand outward so we can have economic growth. Now, first thing I want you to do is we're going to look at economic growth in the short run or how investment impacts the short run. Oh, sorry about that. So I want you to pause this video and draw the long run aggregate supply, aggregate demand, and short run aggregate supply all in equilibrium. And that's where all three cross. And I need to add my P for price level. So once you have this one drawn up, pause this and come back to it. Okay. All right, now that you've got that drawn up, let's show on your graph the impact of reduction in the interest rate in the short run. So that can be by the money supply increasing or the loanable funds market having changes. Remember, loanable funds market is going to alter the real interest rate and the money supply is going to affect the nominal interest rate. So those things are examples of what can happen of something that's going to lower the interest rate. And that's an expansionary policy. We want that to happen. We want to borrow money at low interest. And then when interest rates are low, that will lead to this is my arrow. That's going to lead to investment increasing. Because remember, people borrow money for big ticket items, houses, cars, tools, machines, trucks. And so it'll be a supply side investing or demand side investing, whatever the question tells you. So this one, however, is going to be, let's do an increase in aggregate demand. So this is expansionary, so we're going to shift the aggregate demand curve to the right. And our result is our short run equilibrium right there. And of course, 
in that short run equilibrium, we would end up with an inflationary gap. So we can see from this that price levels have increased because of our rightward shift of AD to AD1. Make sure you get all those labels and arrows in there for a correctly labeled graph at this point. All right, when we have our inflation, we have an inflationary gap. Don't assume in the long run that short run supply will shift to the left. Now, if we revisit the idea of short run supply shifting to the left, sorry, I'm trying to rearrange things. So, what we learned about the long run is if we have an increase in aggregate demand and it creates an inflationary gap then things are going to get more expensive for businesses, short-run supply. Supply is the manufacturers, the producers of GDP. So once their costs are driving up, then they are going to have a negative shock. And also the workers are going to ask for raises, for more money. Everything's going to make it to where things get more expensive. So this long-run equilibrium, that's where we want to be. This is short-run equilibrium or disequilibrium because we are outside of the long-run supply where all three cross. So in the long run, typically, we're going to have a leftward shift and settle into this new price level of inflation. So supply and demand will be happy again once everyone's working at full employment. And this is our long-run reaction. However, what we're going to look at today is another version of it. If we have investment, and that means we have a low interest rate and in investment increases, capital formation is going to increase. So let's go through our steps again. Aggregate demand is going to increase, and it's going to shift to the right, and it's going to put us into short-run equilibrium. So we're in short-run equilibrium at our new aggregate demand. And that would be at our first shift right there. Sorry, that was it right there. Now, what's going to happen, though, is these businesses are going to see all this demand and the interest-sensitive consumption that increased. Demand is also going to have a, a reaction from the supply side. They're going to go, oh, well, look at all this demand. Let's borrow some money at this low interest rate. Let's invest in our businesses. And that way, we can make more stuff. So then certain supply is going to shift to the right. This is how we can have economic growth without inflation. Demand's going to go up either from people, investment, consumption, whatever it is, and then businesses can borrow at that same interest rate and increase their production and get us to this new point of production right here. When that happens, we are actually going to have a double shift and economic growth. So in the short run, we're not going to have inflation. And in the long run, we won't have inflation. And here's how. With our result of capital formation, long run supply is going to increase as well because we know that that would happen because of the economic growth that we showed earlier. Remember economic growth? Now we have capital formation at low interest. We're going to shift long run supply to the right where new short run supply and new aggregate demand have established an amount of GDP we're going to make. So we have economic growth and long run supply illustrated by shifting those to meet this new point in our economy. So we can have economic growth without any inflation if everyone reacts to the low interest rates in the same way. This is only if it is about investment. So if you come across questions about investment and growth, this is the long run result. Now, when you get to your topic questions for 5.6, the first one is going to be about causes of economic growth. So just think about the things that are in capital. The second one, they're going to give you population and labor numbers that are set in place. If they're set in place, how can we improve production? The third one, they're going to ask, give you two countries, GDP, real GDP, real GDP, and divide by population. So it looks like this country does a lot better because they make almost half a million in GDP, where this one makes 200,000. But look at the populations, 20 and 70. So if I do this formula right here, I can see that this country that looks like it makes is a lot better one to live in actually has $7,000 um, of real GDP per person. 
This one has 10,000 per person. So this one actually has a better standard of living. So when you get to your topic questions, this is kind of a rundown or summary of the skills you'll need.